Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very uh, happy to see uh, people in uh, this after the gala dinner. All of you are able to wake up. <laughs> I hope you join the gala dinner. Uh, so it's my great pleasure and a great honor for me to introduce uh, Chris Sander from EDH Zurich. Uh, he is working in the Mechan Mechanical Engineering Department, uh, Institute of Dynamic System and Control, and he heads the uh, Engine System Lab. He will uh, speak about us about uh, unconventional hybrid powertrain. Thank you very much, Alain. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's always a challenge the morning after the, the, the gala dinner. So thank you very much for coming, for those who joined the gala dinner, and for those who didn't uh, join the gala dinner, <coughs> you really missed something. We had a wonderful evening yesterday. And actually, this is the, the good thing about having the first talk after the gala dinner. It's a good occasion to say thank you very much for all the friends in Orléans here for organizing this wonderful event. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here, and uh, re I really enjoy it, personally. <coughs> okay, by say, saying thank you, um, of course the presentation I will give afterwards uh, has been contributed, many, many people contributed, and especially um, I want to emphasize the influence of, the, of this first year, this first group. Oh, come on. <clears throat> Is there another pointer? <clears throat> um, the first group, which is uh, Lino Guzella, the, for our former president of ETH, then Pascal Isla from here, Jan Chamaya from here, and Alain Charlin, who nicely introduced me, and Julian Vasile. So the first project I will uh, tell you about is our pneumatic hybrid uh, project. And actually these People here were the, the of this project. So once Lino visited here in Orléans, Pascal, and then he came back, hey, Pascal had a cool idea of uh, making something with air in the engine, something pneumatic, and so let's, let's do that as well. And uh, so actually there a wonderful cooperation started, and I will give you the story of this. And uh, during this cooperation, of course, we had a, a PhD students here, we had many other students contributing, and we had uh, financial support from the Swiss Federal Office of Energy, Robert Bosch, GmbH joined, and BMW joined the project. So this was the first project, and the second project, that's the Swiss Trolley Plus project. <coughs> there uh, we have uh, Philip Elwood, a former PhD student, and. Uh, my, my deputy in the lab until uh, recently, then Andy Ritter, the PhD student of this project, Fabio, uh, the next PhD student, and many, many others. And again, Swiss Federal Office of Energy, then Heisage, who is doing the bus, and Fabritz, that's the public transportation system of Zurich. And uh, yeah, I can tell you that it's, it's really cool to have your own bus driving in your own city. <laughs> okay, so let's start. Conventional, unconventional hybrids. Why, why is this there's distinction? Conventional hybrid powertrains, I checked that once. Uh, actually, the definition is that they have more than one energy storage and more than one energy converter. And it's a very typical example, of course, combustion engine, electric motor, battery fuel tank. And uh, you basically live from the fact they are complementing each other. So you have, uh, for the high power, you have the combustion engine. For the low power, you have the electric motor. For recharging, you have the electric motor. So they, they work together. And the unconventional hybrid powertrain, as we, we call it, um, has more than one energy storage. <clears throat> so in the example of the pneumatic hybrid, we have a fuel tank and we have an air tank. <clears throat> but we do, not, we do only have one energy converter. So we use the same piece of steel for the combustion engine and for the pneumatic mode. And uh, same for the Swiss Trolley Plus project, which is a trolley bus, which also has a battery. So again, two energy storages, so the, the grid kind of taken as energy storage, and uh, an additional battery. Now let's look into the hybrid pneumatic engine. When we started, uh, we were thinking, okay, what? does the car of the future have to look like? 
uh, there are these, these famous four axes, fuel economy, cost efficiency, drivability, low emissions. And of course, environmental axis is on the left side. <coughs> you have to look for good fuel economy and low emissions. <coughs> and actually what the customer wants is, he wants fuel, good fuel economy, but he wants, wants cost efficiency and he wants uh, drivability. And in this uh, field of conflict, there we try to find out, okay, what could be a new propulsion system for compact vehicles, why compact vehicles? Uh, because they are the largest market, we have very cost sensitive customers, small vehicles, so actually it's not the ideal segment for classical hybridization because it's, it's too costly, the classical hybridization. So can we do something that is more cost effective, still very fuel efficient, should be simple <clears throat> and not a lot of space should be required. And uh, this was actually the idea where uh, Lino came from, from Pascal. Not exactly this, but this is what we made out of it. So we have a combustion engine. In this case, we have a two-cylinder here. Uh, two cylinders, uh, two intake valves, originally two exhaust valves. Uh, we change one exhaust valve to a so-called charge valve. And this charge valve then is connected to this air pressure tank. So this is our second energy storage here. <clears throat> and then, very important, it's a small engine, so we need a turbocharger to provide uh, enough power so that the drivability of the car still is, is okay. <clears throat> so we have uh, the motor mode. So if we have air here in our, in our pressure tank, we can use the charge valve and the combustion engine uh, as a pneumatic motor. So we let air Entering the cylinder, the pressure of the air presses the cylinder down, as in the combustion, and so we can do, we can do a motor mode. We can also start the engine pneumatically, so by simply introducing air. Uh, of course, if we use air, we also have to, to get it from somewhere, so we have to pump. <coughs> and this is actually the recuperation. So whenever we do fuel cutoff, uh, we decelerate, uh, we, we can pump. We use the engine as a pneumatic pump and we fill up our air pressure tank. And then, most important, as it turned out later, the boost mode. What is the boost mode? The boost mode introduces air when the engine is running in combustion mode, but when the turbocharger has not yet speeded up, so is not yet providing enough air for the torque that you want, so then you can introduce additional air into the cylinder from your air pressure tank. So that's the boost mode. <clears throat> okay, then we need, we set up a lot of simulation models. So before we started with the hardware, of course. So we used process models, mean value models, quasi-static models, what, what were the time scales. So the process models really works on a crank angle base, mean value models, engine cycle base, then the quasi-static model for fuel consumption calculation. This is um, in seconds range. So complexity high, medium, low, and what, what are they good for? So the process model was needed to optimize the pneumatic modes, basically the, the valve actuation, when do we have to open the valve, close the valve, etc. <coughs> then uh, the mean value models for the more classical engine control, so taking into account the additional air that comes uh, from the air tank and the air from the turbocharger, what do we have to do with the spark advance, uh, all these things. And then here, that's the energy management level, so we calculate the fuel consumption, we optimize the modes, we take care that our, fuel, uh, our air tank uh, will not be empty and always uh, ready to, to do a pneumatic start again. <coughs> okay, so the goal in the simulation study was to evaluate the best system configuration, so we investigated natural aspirated engines, downsized and turbocharged, um, we inv will investigate idling versus uh, stop-start, then the engine valves, two, actually two interesting options. We had um, one system where we had camshaft actuated valves, uh, intake valve and exhaust valve, only the charge valve fully variable, and then we also looked into the case where all the valves were fully variable. What constraints did we have? Uh, we wanted to have the same maximum power of course, 
Our drive cycle was uh, the new appearing driving cycle. We want to be charge sustaining, and yeah, as I said before, charge valve uh, fully variable. <coughs> okay, so starting from the drivetrain, uh, I mean, that's standard procedure, backward calculations from wheels to torque converters. Uh, then we had to check the, the various degrees of freedom, so the engine modes, we had to choose them optimally, so we wanted to minimize the fuel consumption. Uh, we did that with dynamic programming, of course. So these were all offline simulations in advance before we started with the hardware. Uh, the pneumatic modes, uh, we optimized them with the process model I said before, and we took care that the uh, state of charge of the tank pressure was always sufficiently high. <coughs> so then these were the results. Um, four curves here. So this is fixed camshaft uh, downsizing only. So that's the blue line. So here we have engine size, and here we have CO2 savings. So we start with the naturally aspirated engine. We downsize the naturally aspirated engine and su supplied with a turbocharger. And we go down to a one liter engine, so a factor of two downsizing, which is really a lot. So usually you do downsizing factor of maximum 1.5, maybe even 1.4, 1.3. So, so factor of two is, that's really heavy. And uh, you will see later factor of two is not doable with standard uh, turbocharging. So this is the, the advantage of the downsizing. So actually you get 25% benefit only from the downsizing. And then if you add start stop, um, here you are Six, the well-known 6%, of course, that scales down to something like 3% here. And then if we add the hybrid modes, so if we add pneumatic motor, so if we, all, if we also drive pneumatically, then this gives us another 2 to 3%. It's not a lot, because air is a really bad energy storage. So for driving pneumatically, it's not a very good idea. <coughs> And then the fourth line here, uh, this would happen if all the valves would be fully available. And of course, then you also can de-throttle the naturally aspirated engine. So you will get an, already an additional benefit of, of 20% as we calculated. And then uh, downsizing and doing all the pneumatics uh, gives you additional, let's say, 12%. So the decision was we wanted to go for, for the green line here in, in a first attempt due to simplicity. And uh, this is what I mentioned before about the turbocharger. So if you want to do a load step here from, let's say, 8% load to 100% load at 2,000 RPM, you would like to have the red line. This is what your 2-liter engine would deliver. And your 1-liter turbocharged engine, it will basically go to 50% and then very slowly move up to the 100% because for a small engine, 2,000 RPM is already pretty low speed. So uh, what we actually want, want to do is improve this one here, and we can do that much better. So the boost mode gives you this uh, drivability back again. So we inject compressed air directly into the combustion chamber. Uh, this is what we call the boost mode, and then this, this happens here. So this is without boost, and this will be with boost. So you have, as a first step, you go basically to 50%, and then even more, because you introduce additional air. And then physics for, for this one time helps us, because uh, the turbocharger will be accelerated faster because we have an increased exhaust enthalpy. So you see the, flow, the slope here? It's steeper than this slope here. So you will actually reach your full load torque within more or less one second, which, which then is, is fine again. So for a turbocharged engine, getting the torque within so something below one second, that's fine. So actually, the boost mode is really the enabler of the heavy downsizing. If we want to exploit this 25% I showed you before, then we need something to, to keep, keep the drivability. Otherwise, the customer will not buy this car. OK, so being more or less convinced about from the simulations, we said, OK, let's, let's build it. Let's do it. 
Uh, we took a, an engine which was even a bit smaller than, than planned, so we took a 0 0.75 liter engine, uh, two cylinder from uh, Weber, it's a multi-purpose multi engine from Weber, that's a small company at the Lake of Constance, they're providing these engines. So here you see the cylinder head of uh, this engine here, and you see that this is the exhaust side, we had to separate of course the exhaust channel because we had to separate exhaust valve from charge valve, the charge valve goes then into the pressure tank. And this is the setup for the fully variable valve system, which is this one here. This is the Bosch EHVS fully variable valve system. So a direct electro-hydraulic valve system, so it needs a hydraulic supply from a hydraulic pump. And actually the switching is done with uh, two uh, solenoid valves here. Uh, a system that was completely developed by Bosch, and uh, unfortunately they, they didn't uh, uh, go on with it, but we found a very nice application for that, so we asked our friends at Bosch and they provided us with all the hardware. Uh, this is how the engine then looked like. You see here, again, exhaust side. So you see uh, this is the, the pipes from the exhaust valve. Here you see the turbocharger, and these pipes go down here to the pressure tank. You see it down here below. So there's a steel pressure tank below the engine. Okay, so what did the measurements show? Uh, step from low load to full load here was really manageable within one engine cycle. So here, the two cylinders at low load, this is a pressure, cylinder pressure here, and these are the two cylinders at high load. It's really from one engine cycle to the next, we can do the step from low to high. <clears throat> and this is how it looks uh, over time, so you see here, so without the boost, it would take um, approximately two seconds to go from three bar PME to 15, and with the boost, almost immediate reaction. I mean, what you see here is not noise. These are the, the oscillations from our drivetrain. So we had a, we had a damping system within, uh, between the engine and, the, and the, the chassis dyno, and these were the oscillations in this shaft. So it's really an immediate switch from low to high when you, in, for to high when you introduce this additional air. So this was a very um, successful first experiment. We also could do the pneumatic start, as you see here. And uh, measurement and simulation pretty very fit very well. So this was really nice on this engine here. So the process model could be actually uh, validated and verified uh, with these measurements. And finally, uh, the fuel savings when we emulated uh, several cars, so we emulated the Nissan Micra, the VW Polo, which is about the, the, the power of the, uh, the power class of our, of our engine. <coughs> and uh, we emulated a fuel consumption reduction of around 30%. So this, again, fits what we simulated. Well, then we were very happy and um, we thought, okay, let's go to some OEMs and tell them about this, and uh, of course they will make us offers. Uh, we did that, and um, they told us, come on, guys, much too complicated. The HVS system, you need additional oil supply, too complicated. Try to simplify that. Okay, we tried. And uh, we, again, thought about the, the CO2 savings. We realized that with the boost itself, we get the 25%, that's from the downsizing, uh, the start-stop is the additional 3% and hybrid is additional 3%. So if we do not go for the start-stop, so not, if we do not go for the pneumatic start, and we do not go for the pneumatic motor mode, then we would have the 25%, but then we could also do with intake manifold boosting. Because if we do intake manifold boost, if we have a pressure tank, we have a boost valve in the intake manifold, we can basically do something very similar. I will show afterwards. So that's the, uh, the one case. Or we still go for the start-stop, but we try to do camshaft actuated charge valves. So we, we reduce the controllability of the valve, so we will not be able to do everything again, but 
the, si the system would be much simpler. Okay, so first look, let's look, look into the indirect boost. So we have here the boost valve. Of course, if you uh, have here the pressure tank and you have no possibility to refill it with your engine, so you need a compressor for this system. So that's one drawback. But let's look about the <coughs> dynamic behavior. Actually, the dynamic behavior is very interesting uh, because it's really fast. So what you see here is uh, this is a, the, the PME that we want to reach, and this is um, intake manifold pressure and turbocharger speed. And you see that the turbocharger starts here and should go here. And during the time when the turbocharger speeds up, <coughs> we have to uh, increase the intake manifold pressure with our with, our, with boosting, indirect boosting. So we push up the intake manifold pressure, and then, so of course, we have to close the throttle here, because otherwise the air would, uh, would exit through the throttle. And then we have to, to increase the pressure, and then we have to open the throttle again, close the boost valve, and, and end up at the, at the pressure that we need here. So from a control perspective, also a very interesting system. And uh, actually, we, we built it. So you see, it's a, we took a rather large valve because we wanted to be fast. And the results, results again, are very similar to the simulations. You see here, is again, the pressure, pressure build up, and then reducing back to the demanded pressure. And here you see the torque. And you see, again, a very fast torque rise. These are the oscillations. And you see here, I mean, it's, it's even faster than direct boosting. That's what's kind of astonishing for us that if you do intake manifold boosting, you're faster than really when you do it uh, in the cylinder. The reason for that is um, if you do the boosting in the cylinder, uh, you're limited by the size of the charge valve. So you cannot put that much air into the cylinder. You have to use then the quick speed up of the turbocharger to get the full load. And with intake manifold boosting, I mean, you saw that in this picture here. I mean, you have plenty of space. So you can, you can take a large valve. So that's no problem. But you're really fast. But there is a but. No, it's not yet a but. So if you compare direct and indirect boosting, you see here the indirect boosting is, is solid. It's, it's really extremely fast. The direct boosting, that's this line here. And one nice thing with the indirect boosting is also that you can tune it. So you can make it uh, as fast as you want. So this is what we, we call then the, the demo mode, so that we can do a very slow indirect boosting. Of course, then you need less additional air, but of course, you're, you're slow. The drawback of indirect boosting you see here, it's the amount of air you need. You need much more air, basically three to four times as much. And that was the killer, because uh, the companies that we talked with uh, said, OK, if we have to have such a large tank for this system, this will not work. We, will, we cannot place such a large air tank into a small vehicle. So, OK, so this option uh, was done. So then we said, OK, air consumption very high, additional compressor needed. Let's go back to this one here. So let's try this option here. So cams have to actuate the charge valve. <clears throat> so simple valve actuation needed, one fixed valve lift profile for each mode. Uh, so we started with the system being having three lobes, and we could switch between the three lobes, like the Audi system, for instance. So one for boosting, one for, uh, for starting, and one for pumping here. And of course, challenges, profile design of the lobes, uh, the torque control in boost mode, because the control authority was reduced. So we could not supply exactly the amount of air that we needed. We had to take the air that was with the, the boost mode provided, and everything else we had to do otherwise. So that's a certain control challenge. Um, so we had to use other actuators, and we actually used the uh, ignition and throttle, of course. <clears throat> so again here, measurement results. Uh, looks very similar to what we had before. Uh, not that fast, but still, still fast here. So with the boost, the blue curve, um, and also the, the pneumatic start uh, worked very well with the fixed, uh, fixed lobes. So the conclusion was um, we could get a very good fuel economy by downsizing and turbocharging, 
Uh, with the boost mode, we got the drivability, and cost efficiency was done by camshaft driven charge valve uh, and the pressure tank, so we don't need a costly battery as compared to the electric hybrid. Um, so actually, we thought at that time the air would be a cost-effective approach to, be fuel, to improve fuel economy, and that could be a very interesting option. Okay, so how did we realize it? Um, we replaced this EHVS, camshaft actuated valve, so here are the three different lobes. We were looking for a fuel saving potential of 28%, because the 3% of the uh, pneumatic motor mode, uh, we did not use them. Again, system analysis. And now, maybe you realize that the car changed slightly. So we started with a very small compact car, and uh, talking to our, to our partners, we found out it's probably easier, easier to enter from, from the top cost area and then trickle down to the low cost cars because it's much easier to introduce a new fancy system into an expensive car. So that was kind of the, the, the goal of the project now. Again, many, many simulations, many, many optimizations. And uh, BMW came up with an extremely clever uh, variation of their uh, valve actuation system. So the Valvetronic system, probably, maybe, probably you know that, uh, you, can, uh, you can vary uh, the position of your opening and also the lift, and they introduced to the chart, you see the chart valve here in blue, into this, va this Valvetronic system by a shaft in shaft system. Uh, very clever, extremely reliable also. So we had this system running on our engine test bench for a very long time, we never had a failure. Um, it was implemented on the B38 engine. So this is the combustion engine, which is uh, in the I8. Small engine, it's a 1500 cubic centimeter, so 500 cubic centimeter uh, per cylinder. It has a direct injection, and it has a very well-designed combustion chamber, I have to say. So we used this engine afterwards also for combustion control experiments, and it has a very, very good combustion. So it's, it's a very, very good engine for these uh, experiments. And again, uh, we needed various tools for the, for the system design here, the, the process simulation for the valve design, mean value models for the control, uh, QSS, and dynamic programming for the sizing of the air tank and the, and the mode uh, choice. And again, here are the results. So this is, um, oh, this is measurement, yeah. So, uh, very important, how could we fill our pressure tank? Um, actually, within 10 seconds, we could go between 1,500 and 4,000 RPM. We could go up to 11 bar to 13 bar, starting with 6 bar. 6 bar is the minimum pressure that we need to be able to do a pneumatic start. So, if we have less than 6 bar, we are not able to start pneumatically. So actually, this, this was fine, because for one boost, we need 0 0.7 bar. So actually, um, here are the number of boosts that we can do. So if we recuperate for 15 seconds, we can do 10 boosts. If we recuperate for 10 seconds, we can do between, uh, let's say, 8 and, and 10 boosts. And that was thought to be sufficient. Because, I mean, you cannot do as, you, of course you can do many boosts, but at some time you also will go off your gas pedal because you have to decelerate and then you can fill up your tank again. So actually that was never a problem to refill the tank. Uh, how did we, did we refill the tank? Of course, by when we had fuel cut off, we, had, we were in the compression phase, then we opened the boost valve, and then we pushed the air into our air tank. <clears throat> Okay, then engine start. Was this doable? Um, it was very well doable. So here, this is conventional start here, and this was a direct start. We could even do direct start because we had a direct injection, direct fuel injection, in contrast to the, to the two-cylinder engine, which, which had a port fuel injection. So we could inject air and fuel simultaneously and then start uh, the engine with the combustion. That worked very nicely. And there's a nice story behind this curve here. Because um, 
It worked on the test bench and it worked in simulation, but both did not fit together. And we could not find out why. We investigated a lot. And then suddenly one morning, Christoph Holzer, the project manager, the PhD student of the project, came to my office, showed me a plot, both curves identical. I said, hey, come on, that's not possible. What did you do? He said, I don't know. This is how the engine behaves now. <laughs> So for this one time, the physics changed in our advantage. And what we, f what we found out then is, the engine has a dual mass flywheel. We did not model the dual mass flywheel. And at some point, so these, these harsh accelerations of the flywheel that we introduced with the boost mode, at some time, it locked. So we actually destroyed the dual mass flywheel, it locked, and from then on, everything was fine. <laughs> So for this one time, the physics uh, joined the simulation. Uh, and it worked very well. OK, again, um, this is the load step, fast enough. Within half a second, we can, we can do the, the full load step. And this is an interesting plot, because here you see the, the air masses. So this is what comes from the integ manifold. And this is what comes. Uh, integ manifold plus charge valve. So green is charge valve here, so we open the charge valve and here we close it. So we add this amount of air to the blue curve and we end up with the red curve. And you see that the desired air mass will be the yellow one. So actually here we have more air than we need. So what do we have to do? I mean the driver wants this torque. He does not want to have increased torque and then suddenly step back. So what we actually had to do is with the ignition we had to reduce the torque here. So this is ignition. And then everything was fine again. An additional advantage of this ignition actuation here was that we increased the exhaust enthalpy, so the turbocharger speeded up even faster. So it was, this was a, a nice additional effect. So actually, the air demand in simulation, we got 5.2 grams, and the ex experiment showed 5.1 grams, so again, a very good model fit. So this is a more uh, transient simulation here. So this is a, when we emulated the car and we, we simulated a, a tip-in. So you see here the, the torque rise, again, measurement simulation. And here's the, the turbocharger speed. <coughs> and actually, this engine was then built into a demonstrator. So this built into a mini and compared to other um, devices to, to make the system more dynamic. So they, so they compared to 48 volt uh, electric uh, compressor with a 48 volt uh, starter generator, and then a 12 volt um, electric compressor, conventional turbocharger technology of 2021, and a 48 uh, volt starter generator, and the, the base engine, and red direct boost. And you see, direct boost performed best. And actually, all the people that drove this car, they were really excited. It was really cool to drive. Everyone loved that car. So what happened then? Well, to tell you the truth, nothing. <laughs> BMW said, well, it's a cool system, but you know, it's a combustion engine. We have to invest at the moment so much money into the electric mobility. We can't afford this additional system. So at the moment, it's in whoever's ever drawer, um, waiting for maybe to be uh, awakened sometime. But uh, we had a lot of fun in this, in this project. It was extremely interesting. We could really do everything from the system design, the control design, building up the hardware, doing the tests. And we always said, it's kind of the control engineer's dream of an engine. You have spark, fuel, and air, all three in your hands. You can do everything that you want. So this was really a lot of fun. And maybe five years later, in 2024 or whatever, maybe they come back to us again and ask, hey, we had this project, remember? Why not doing that once again? OK, so I mean, when Alan asked me to tell about this hybrid pneumatic engine project, 
I told him, come on, the project is finished, so it will be a requiem, <laughs> this talk. And, um, but actually, I think it's very nice to, to have here this requiem in Orléans, where everything started. So we still have, we still have the patents, we still pay for the patents to, so that we keep them, so uh, we still keep a small part of hope that the system will be on road again, because technically, I mean, all the engineers that worked with the system that, that tried it out, they were excited. They said, come on, that's the system to do. But the reality sometimes is different, and we learned, we learned a lot. We learned, for instance, also that for lo a large company, it's difficult if you do not have an add-on system. I mean, you, you, you saw the, the various systems that they compared to. I mean, this is, all, this is everything add-on. You take the base engine, you add some hardware. If you do pneumatic hybridization, it's a different cylinder head. It's basically a different engine. So it's not an add-on system. So this is one kind of my, my personal learning out of this project. You have to do modular changes to have a chance that you get into series production. Okay, so the next unconventional hybrid, as I always said in the beginning, um, it's the hybrid trolleybus. So trolleybus, actually in Switzerland, trolleybuses are pretty uh, often used, pretty popular. Um, in other countries, they are less popular. And even they reduced the, the trolley lines in Germany for some time, and now they're building them up again. So let's look a little bit into trolleybus technology. Uh, what are the advantages? You have almost no noise. You have very high passenger capacity because they're pretty large. Uh, high power density, pollution free. On the other hand, they're not flexible. They're expensive, the, the bus is expensive, and also the, the overhead lines are expensive because you need two overhead lines. Not as in the train or in the tram where you have the, the mass on the floor. A trolley bus needs two overhead lines, and it also needs an emergency auxiliary power unit. If something fails with the overhead line, you have to get somehow back into your, into your garage. So the problem is you're bound to the grid, and the public transportation system of, uh, of Zurich uh, was investigating new types of vehicles, so they investigated uh, various systems, so they looked into the electro electric buses, trolley buses, hybrid buses. We had also projects on hybrid buses and fast charging buses, and actually all of them have a lot of pro and cons. And uh, the nice thing with the battery-assisted trolley bus is that it collects many, many advantages. So you are noise-free, emission-free, uh, you have high cap passenger capacity, uh, you're flexible, you don't have um, the charge problem, and uh, still you're noise-free and, and emission-free and you're very flexible. So this was the, the setup, and uh, so they decided to go for a battery-assisted trolley bus. Still needs infrastructure, but it needs less infrastructure, because if you size the battery uh, a certain size, then you can drive without uh, overhead lines. So the conventional technology, a diesel APU usually, and our new uh, technology, you have the traction battery on top of the bus here, you have flexible operation, route extension, less overhead lines. And this is important, less overhead lines, because if you have large crossings, so everyone that once visited Zurich, we, we have large crossings where we have trams, we have trolley buses, we have normal buses. And there you have many, many places where the trolley lines cross the tram lines. So you have connectors there. And this is, on the one hand, extremely expensive, and it's also very uh, cost, costly to maintain the system. So actually what they're doing now, since they're having these, these buses, they're removing these very costly crossings. It also looks much nicer if you don't have all the overhead lines. And there you have to drive uh, with your battery. <coughs> and maybe some of you remember three years ago in Colmarne, uh, my PhD student, Andy Ritter, he showed this slide that was a simulation slide of um, the energy saving of this system of this Swiss Trolley Plus system when you have several buses on one bus line. So you see here, this is the map of Zurich, so you see this one bus line where this uh, Swiss Trolley Plus bus was intended to drive. 
And the, a very special property of these uh, trolley buses is that you have um, uh, sectors here. And within these sectors, you have uh, a separate power supply for the lines, and you cannot transfer energy from one sector to the other. So when you have several buses on your line, or usually you have about uh, 20 buses on, on this line here, um, you can only transfer energy from, with a standard trolley bus from bus to bus if they are in the same sector. If they are not in the same sector, you cannot transfer the energy, you have to waste it with the, uh, the, the, the brake resistors. So what we found out is that um, if you increase the number of battery-assisted buses, you can save up to 15% primary energy. Although it's still an electric bus, you have an electric motor with a high efficiency, simply by using the energy more efficiently and taking care of these um, sector switches and the energy uh, transfer between the, the, between the buses here. So this was simulation and you see here that these are the dates. So this was measurement March 2019. So the bus is now really hot driving around with our energy management system. And uh, I mean, we can look at the laptop and tell, uh, tell exactly what happens on the bus. And I tell you, that's really cool having this bus in your own town. And uh, the re results show that we get energy savings between 8 to 18%. So that's exactly what, what we simulated at that time. So we were pretty happy. And um, what you also see here is this. So this is a comparison between standard trolley bus and our trolley bus. The standard trolley bus draws this from the grid and recuperates this bar here to the grid. So there's another bus in the same sector that takes this amount of energy, which then gives, so this minus this gives this one here. And our bus does not need to send electric energy to the grid to another bus because you can store it in the battery. And this is a huge advantage because you do not have to build a bidirectional voltage converter for the bus. It makes it much cheaper. Actually, this, the new bus is cheaper than the old one due to exactly this fact, that you do not need to provide energy to the grid. It's a one way. It makes it much easier. So the bus is now driving around, and of course, Zurich is a, it's a rather hilly, hilly city, so it goes up and down. We have um, height differences of uh, more than, than 100 meters. And uh, of course, you have to take care of this, uh, of this height difference to always have enough energy in your battery. And there, of course, um, comes the idea, well, what can we do with, uh, with model predictive control? Uh, if we know where we are, if we, if we know the map, how much can we save? And actually, with the, with the current bus, we made many simulations. We also made many measurements. And we kind of were a bit disappointed because by even having a very clever energy management, we did not save a lot of energy. And then we thought, OK, what happens if we either reduce the battery size or we increase the grid-free portion? So here we have grid-free 2.3 kilometers this would be possible 8.5 kilometers. So a share of 50% compared to a share of 14%. So what happens then? Uh, faster. Yeah. Um, then we, we realized that if we have a large battery, so that's the situation we have at the moment with our bus, uh, Energy, additional energy consumption compared to the, to the optimal case, dynamic programming. If we have a model predictive control here, we have 4%. And this 4% that remains even if we make the battery smaller. But the standard, so adaptive ECMS backup, backup uh, energy management system, they increase the additional energy consumption. So the smaller the battery, the better it is if you use clever energy management techniques. So actually, you need to know where you are. And we implemented this, this uh, automated map detection. So we, we build up our own map. So the bus driver doesn't have to do anything. It sits in the morning in the bus. The bus drives its route. And after it's driven uh, one time, the bus knows where it is. And it knows also additional things. 
But first, uh, where do the improvements actually come from? Um, it, they basically come from the fact that uh, the current is smaller. So the converter output power is concentrated at approximately 60 kilowatt, which is um, the charging power that is just the, the minimum charging power to remain uh, a good state of charge of the battery. And if you look, so this is the non-causal non optimum. If you look at, for instance, the, the backup energy management system, it's a much broader distribution of a converter output. And interesting enough, you see here, with the clever um, energy management system, you see a peak at, at 50 kilowatt. And this actually, that's the power that we are allowed to charge the battery when we are at a bus stop. At the bus stop, you are not allowed to charge with more than 50 kilowatt because otherwise you would weld your overhead lines to your bus. And this, of course, you do not want. So this, this comes from that. So what can you do additionally? Um, you can detect where you have these, these line breaks. What is the good, this good for? Well, what happens if you, if you uh, drive over a line break? You see that here. Now it comes. Yes. You have these these uh, arcs, and these arcs are disturbing in the night, and they also destroy the overhead lines. So always a small, small mass of uh, overhead line is, uh, is vaporized when you have these arcs. So they are heavily unwanted. So what can you do? Uh, very simple. You detect the gaps. This is what you see here. So this is the voltage that you measure in the overhead line. And of course, as soon as the voltage drops, then you know you are at the gap. So now we are coming to, to Kirche Flonten. So there we will have a gap. Yes, the blue point here. You saw the voltage dropping. And then we see that uh, the map includes this, this gap into the map. Another one here, blue point. And here the voltage drop. And then, of course, you can use this information. You can supply your energy management with the detection of the wire, wire gaps. And then you see this. So, so you, you see this is the existing map, and then it has to merge the map. So it will have, yeah, now it, the, the map flipped here. And here we have a line break. And as soon as it will approach this point here, you will see that the energy management will go to to zero, which means zero from the overhead grid and everything from the battery. Duck, this one here. So at the moment, we have parameterized at 20 meters before we have the gap. Uh, we tell the energy management system so to, to reduce the current, and then we drive without current through the gap, and then we increase it again. OK, so the conclusion of this project up to now is that uh, even though we have the same electric motor, we have electric grid, which is quite good, we have quite significant energy consumption reduction that is possible. Of course, you need to know where you are on the map. You, you're able to detect where you have to reduce uh, the current um, in your system. And I tell you, building up a map is not, is not that easy. I mean, it looks very easy, but you have a noisy GPS system, you have noisy, noisy uh, wheel, wheel signals, um, you have to merge this into a, into a map, and then uh, when you drive it several times, you always have different information, you have the merged information. So that's actually pretty tricky. So um, Andrita, the PhD student who is doing this, uh, spent quite some time in, in uh, designing reliable algorithms. And what is very important, the driver, should not be bothered with this. It has to run fully automatically. So if the driver has to initiate something, now he has to push a button to do whatever, it will not work because he will forget. He's allowed to forget because he has to concentrate on the traffic. And the traffic in Zurich with all the trams and cars and bikes, it's a challenge. So we do not want him to bother with the system. Everything has to run on its own. And actually, now we are just finishing this, this first step of the project. So the energy management runs 
on the bus, the map runs on the bus, uh, the detection of the various instances. And the next step we do in this project is we will optimize heating and cooling of the bus because for these type of buses, the energy spent for um, heating and cooling is in the same range as the energy spent for, for driving. So it's worth also looking into this one here. Okay, and maybe another outlook. What are we doing else if we are not doing hybrid pneumatic and, uh, and electric buses? At the moment, we work a lot, something like hybrid, dual fuel engine, natural gas, diesel pilot. We are looking into natural gas with scavenged pre-chamber. Actually, we just recently uh, reached efficiencies of these engines more than 45% with the engine size of two liter. So passenger car engine size, efficiency 45% with natural gas and scavenged pre-chamber. So this is really good value. And uh, we will also in investigate natural gas, gas with hydrogen, maybe to improve uh, catalytic uh, conversion and also the combustion. Actually, I think natural gas is much, much underestimated, so we should go much more into natural gas to, to get the 25% CO2 reduction that are simply for free. And this ends my talk, and I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Has anyone a question? Chris, really nice. Um, what a great overview, especially the pneumatic engine over a decade. That really well done. Um, I have a really stupid question. How do you connect and disconnect uh, the trolleys from the electric line when you go? Um, how does that switch occurs? It's not physical. Do you actually lower the yes, pantograph? Yes. yes, we actually lower them. And how do you then get it back up? Uh, how, how do you do that reliably? Um, at the at the end entrance point where you go back to the grid, you have something like a um, uh, two two sheet, sheets of metal and they just lead the overhead. It's, it's actually very simple, but it works. Simple mechanic. Yeah, yeah. We we do not pull them down when we have uh, the the brakes. There it goes through. Yeah, but simple mechanics, and I mean the driver slows down a bit, so that's okay. It works. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering about the pneumatic uh, system. Did you explore the possibility of playing with the throttle uh, at the same time with throttle and the compressed air in order to vary aerodynamic uh, behavior within the chamber? I guess it may be something uh, who could reduce emissions and put it back in the game, uh, your system. It's uh, something... Uh, uh, automakers. Um, actually, when you when you activate the charge valve, you have an extremely high turbulence, so uh, the combustion is very fast when you activate the, the boost mode. So we we found only advantages by activating the boost mode. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Okay. So thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, as uh, you may know, we also played around with the pneumatic hybrid uh, some 10 years ago or something like that. And uh, one thing that we found very useful was uh, the ability to uh, uh, store a lot of energy by replacing friction brakes with the, uh, uh, the pump mode. Uh, but that requires uh, full uh, variability of the, the charge valve. Is that something you... Uh, used as well or uh, we investigated that I mean then you go to two stroke mode yeah exactly and you have okay. you need the full variability we simulated that but we did not build that in hardware okay yeah. thanks thank you for this nice talk um, have you anything done about emissions of uh, the pneumatic uh, hybrid because um, I didn't see 
uh, any plots about uh, how you handle we, this? We haven't seen actually any problems because we were always able to keep the air to fuel ratio very constant. I mean, of course, you have to take care of your air to fuel ratio control. It's, it's more complicated than standard. But still, you can use a three way catalytic converter, you run stoichiometrically. Uh, it's, it's really, and I mean, it, oops, sorry, important is that um, you have to have a clear distinction between the air modes and the combustion modes. So there, for, um, for one to two engine cycles, for instance, if you do fuel cutoff, first you have to wait until you activate the pump mode because you want to avoid that you get a fuel into your air tank and vice versa. So you have to make very good switches, but then if you do the switches correctly, actually it's, uh, it's not a problem with a three-way catalytic converter. No more question? Time so for the coffee break. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again, Chris, for this interesting presentation. It's remind me a lot of uh, souvenir. <laughs> and uh, so it's time for the coffee break. Thank you.